All right, let's do it live on a Game Week First Friday edition of the program. It's getting real around here. I saw Nick Chubb at a podium. I saw Jacoby Brissett at a podium. We'll have Coach Stefanski at a podium here momentarily, my friend. Oh, it's getting very real. We are a day away yeah. from the kickoff of the 2022 NFL season and a banger between the Bills <laughs> and the Rams. Start. Like, I'm fired up for that. We've got us on Sunday. Oh, yeah, it's real. Here comes the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday practices, and then boom, board the plane to Charlotte, North Carolina, Flair Country. Woo! Take on the Panthers Sunday morning. I'm excited. Do you think any of his, uh, all, I, that uh, no context flair, was any of that scripted or that's all off the cuff? My, back then, they wouldn't be scripted word so for word. Just pretty much. You knew where he was going. And sure. Then, and then yeah, there he's got to really sell the match, one. but sell it however you want to sell it. Right. There's one for everyone. Uh, yeah, it's very appropriate to go into Flair Country because this one has a WWE feel to it, doesn't it? I was just <laughs> – that's right? so funny you say that. I, so I was just talking with my good friend Steve Rosen was here on some <clears> business, <throat> and, and we had to hang out for a second in the lobby. And I, we were talking about it, and I was like, look, I don't know that the, the, the league is trying to put the spotlight on this game. You look at, like, the crew that's going to do the game relative Who to – Who do we know, have Could today? it have been Nance? It's Spiro Didis, Jay Feely, and then Aditi on the sideline. Okay. So – I said, you know, it, it, I don't feel like they want to play. I said, and we came to the conclusion. I said, this is WWE. This is it is a loser leaves town match happened. He's gone, but now yet he's back mm -hmm. for restitution. And you want to show him that no, there will be no restitution for you. And so this is this is a big matchup uh, against it, this Panthers team, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm actually as I'm getting into now, I'm really diving into. Uh, you know, this matchup and I got my boards are, are ready to go. Well, they're not ready to go, but they are you're getting there ready to be started to be filled in and everything and just, you know, learning about this. this All right, we team. got coach. Let's hear from the coach. There okay. he is. Coach Gets fancy. Going down to Carolina. These are down. So the preparations are underway. Uh, you know, this team, I think, is a, is a good football team. I know Coach Rule well. I uh, have a ton of respect for him and what he's building down there. You know, you just look at them on all three sides of the ball. Their offense with Coach McAdoo, uh, you know, for us, there's a little bit of the unknown with Coach McAdoo being last in uh, Jacksonville, calling it in New York, obviously was in Green Bay. So have some tape on Coach going back a little bit and then obviously the preseason. But there's unknown. It's week one. That's kind of how that works. Uh, defensively with Coach Snow, he's been with Coach Rule for a long time. Very, very aggressive, uh, high, high pressure rate. Good players at all three levels of the defense, uh, so quite the challenge. And then special teams, Coach Tabor, uh, who everybody knows uh, was here, uh, really good coach, uh, as sound schemes. So we're going to have to our work cut out for us. So, again, it's Wednesday of, of game week, so a lot to get done, but uh, looking forward to it. And then uh, the team voted for captains, so we're going to have five uh, season captains. We will still have a game captain that's unique to that week. Uh, your captains on offense are Joel Batonio and Nick Chubb on defense, Miles Garrett, Anthony Walker Jr., and on special teams, Charlie Hewlett. So, you know, I always think it's a big deal when, when the team votes, when your teammates vote for, for you. I think that says a lot. So uh, I think those guys are all great leaders in, in their own way uh, and will provide great leadership for this team. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Tim, can you tell us any more about Colin? I know he's going to be out of today. Just, just sick. Just sick. Yeah. Okay. Expect him back. But the first two years, you were not big on team captains. And yeah, I mean, I've you know been on a bunch of teams. Sometimes you have team captains. That was a unique year. Just felt like it was the right thing to do with changing up the captains each week. Uh, so it was, thought it was something that we should do this year. I, I would tell you, and I told the whole team this, you don't need a C on your chest as a leader. Uh, you just don't. Um, so I think leadership comes from a bunch of areas of your football team. Uh, but I do think it says a lot about those players uh, those players that will rep represent us before the game and, and go out there. It says a lot about who you are. It's been a while since Christian McCaffrey's been fully healthy, but a full season. But when he is, what what is the biggest way he stresses a, a, a defense? I would say just he can do it all, Chris. He's so versatile. Uh, he, he runs. Uh, he can run downhill. He can run on the perimeter. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. You can line him up a wide receiver. Uh, there's really not much he, he can't do. He's just a, a really, really good football player. Can you guys listed, somebody listed Anthony Walker as the starter on the depth chart. Mm -hmm. I mean, he and Jacob had been splitting it on the. Yeah, Anthony will start. Okay. Um, 
why will he get the start and you still expect Jacob to play it? Jacob's going to play a ton. You know, you get 11 guys that are quote unquote starters on either side of the ball. And then you have guys that play a ton of football for you and help you win. You know, I would highlight Ronnie Harrison, you know, going to be playing a ton of defense for us, going to be playing a ton of special teams. Is he quote unquote a starter? I guess not, but to me he is. So, you know, we look at it, you got 53 guys on the active, 48 up on game day. They're all going to play. We're going to need all of them. Uh, but uh, obviously you're going to start with 11 on either side. We uh, talked to Nick Chuck today. He, look, he looks to me in a way bigger even than he has been in the past. Is that the case? And how, how much better can he be than he has been your first two years? Yeah, I, I don't know that he's bigger, Jeff, uh, just from a weight and lean mass. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, he looks great. He's in great shape. He's ready to roll. Obviously, didn't play in the preseason. He's fresh. He, he's ready for uh, a good day's work. Even when, when somebody is sick like this today, do you still have those lingering thoughts or, or fears of? I don't like, know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, like, do you take extra measures still to like get him away from everybody so that it, this doesn't turn into a thing? As you can imagine, we're just going with every player, staff member. If you're sick, we'll just always be smart. And uh, but. I don't want to talk too much about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, when you're studying any of the players, Tony, I think you got to look at the full body of work. And obviously with Baker, we had two years of, of work with him uh, in our offense. Uh, you watch the preseason. But, yeah, you definitely go back and study players. Uh, you know, you want to have, a, you want to have as big a sample size as possible to prepare for a guy. Here. The play, it's not position. And I just, it, is there a rhyme or reason just to, to how that plays out? Yeah, uh, just how we like to do it around here. Just uh, forced interaction. Okay. You get offensive guys with defensive guys, older guys with younger guys. Yes, all, all of the above. Yeah, he's practicing today uh, again he's hitting all the benchmarks and we'll just continue to bring him along extremely effective last year circumstances didn't allow you to do that so you had to kind of pivot and, and, and make do so are you, is your goal to kind of get back to that philosophy now that I think every, honestly, Daryl, I mean, I think every team is trying to do that. You're trying to get the lead and then get into four-minute offense. So, of course, for us, yes, uh, whatever formula uh, it is, you'd, you'd love to get a lead early and, and be able to run the ball when they know that you're running it. I mean, that's four-minute football. Um, but you gotta, you got to call and, and play the game that is called for. Couldn't glean too much from the Pittsburgh tape from last year, the the, the last game Baker played here. Um, but how, how do you feel about that? I mean, can you kind of take from what they did to him? No, I think you know. Again, we have uh, two seasons worth of Baker with us in, in this offense. Uh, but that was this that was the Cleveland Browns offense. So hard to say exactly what the Carolina Panthers offense will look like. Again, with a new coordinator, you're watching a lot of tape and you're taking you're, you're making some assumptions uh, based on their personnel but it's it's hard to say until we get to sunday at one yeah you know really good football player uh, has made a ton of plays can make plays on schedule off schedule a uh, ton of arm talent, um, so we have our work cut out for us. We we've seen him make a ton of plays, so we know it's a good football player. This is going to be an emotional game for him and for your guys to a, a different degree. How do you make sure that your guys don't get caught up in that? that this is some kind of a grudge yeah. match. I think for us, Tom, it's Browns versus Panthers. It's it's pretty simple. Uh, we got to prepare for their offense, their defense, their special teams. So that's really where our focus is. Rules or anything because he's so familiar with what you guys do. There's a little bit of that. You know, we talked about it the other day. You don't, you don't want to overthink uh, those type of things, but you understand that he was in our system for two seasons, so knows code words, hand signals, those type of things. So sure, you're you're always, you assume that their coaches know all of that as well. 
help their team get motivated? Did Baker throw a softball to you with what he supposedly did? Yeah, no, no, really, no. The motivation is we're playing a good football team on the road, game one. That's that's really all you need. It's kind of a relatively new phenomenon that nobody plays anymore in the preseason. So mm -hmm. every first game of the season has been a mystery. Have you found that there, there are big surprises in this new era? Yeah, not not really, Tony. I think, you know, like you mentioned, we held some guys out of the preseason. Uh, some teams don't play anybody. Some teams play a ton of people. So I, I do think week one, the preseason, is a distant memory for a lot of people. Um, I know we have guys that didn't play in the preseason that are chomping at the bit. Who will be your kick returners? We'll see. I'd like to say that. <laughs> and, uh, Unrealistic to expect him to be 70 plays ready. Those are th obviously things that we're talking about. Uh, but I would just tell you, with Jack, he has worked very, very hard this offseason. He continues to work hard. So he, he's progressing. Mm -hmm. Do you know who they're going to be? We have a good idea. I think it's kind of what we talked about uh, previously. We have a bunch of guys in this roster that can do it. I'm very comfortable with multiple guys. Uh, who we put out there the, f the first time on punt, kickoff, we'll, we'll see on that. Does anything that happened over the sun summer inform his role heading into the season, or is that water, water under the Oh, water? yeah. No. Um, anything that happened previously, uh, to use your words, water in the bridge, but uh, he's a big part of what we do. Get it on record. Uh, you did get different coaches play calling chances. Yeah. Are you resorting now back to regular season? You'll be calling. Yes. Coach, um, Cade's big leg has that made you recalibrate your metrics for third and fourth downs? Yeah. Uh, now I, I think we have a rookie kicker, right. so we've got to be smart about that and understand he's not going to be perfect right away. That's that's just rookies. Uh, you know, have to grow as the season goes on. Having said that, we think highly of the kid, um, so that will affect decision making, sure. It's young wide receivers from your perspective, ready. Uh, I mean, a lot is going to be expected of them, and they're young players, and a lot of them are inexperienced players. So how do you, from your perspective, balance the counting on them, but also the understanding they are young and similar to Kate, that they're not going to be perfect. Yeah, you know, specifically to the young players, I mean, Donovan doesn't feel young to me anymore. Uh, Anthony Schwartz is a very, very intelligent football player. So I think that room as a whole is, is so mature and, and professional. Uh, I don't worry about, you know, the, is it too big for them part of it. I, I, think, uh, I think they're ready to go. Did you bring up the Browns record in Colton since 99? The game. No. You will, Marla, but I won't. I have the Jacob Phillips with the ones for a lot of the offseason program and then be injured. And then here we are, he's going to start it via captain. What does it say about him the way he handled everything? Well, you know, it gives me an opportunity. I'll talk about Anthony, but it gives me an opportunity to talk about Jacob. You know, I, I think. Very, very highly of Jacob, uh, the player, obviously the person. Uh, just because Anthony's the starter, quote unquote, does not mean that Jacob doesn't have a huge role for us moving forward. Um, he's going to help us win. Anthony Walker, uh, as we've been around the last couple of years, I mean, there's a reason we kept him around. There's a reason we wanted him back here uh, in this building. Uh, he provides great leadership, uh, very good communicator, does a great job, uh, you know, running the defense, if you will. Um, so excited about him, and and you're right, he worked through injuries, but he, he's somebody that you can count on uh, to stay engaged throughout. Wh whether he's in in the huddle, on the sideline, he, he's always staying engaged. James would be active for this game. I think we're working through it. Uh, I tell you, he's very intelligent, so uh, I don't think it'll be something that he can't do. But we're working through it. Time to really get these defensive tackles up to speed. What about what they've shown you makes you confident in the depth of the Confident in? In the depth of the 
rotation oh. there. Yeah, Cam, I think they're, you know, those guys have worked very hard. Uh, I've seen it in practice. I kind of know what they're capable of. Um, I think we've played good defense uh, at that position the last couple of years. I think these guys are ready to do the same. Good. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. You're up. All right, there's Coach Stefanski at the podium as we prepare to take on Carolina. Lots to get to on that end. Uh, we mentioned Jacoby Brissett was made available. Uh, I believe you'll hear from him a little bit later on in the program. Yeah, that's going to be in the 2 o'clock hour. Lots of news around the NFL as well. We're off and running here on a first Friday edition of Cleveland Browns Daily, 850 ESPN Cleveland. The Bath Authority gives you that bathroom of your dreams. You can transform your current bathroom into a custom bath with a spa-like feel. Again, in about a day, the Bath Authority makes it real for you for a fraction of the cost of the competitors. The Bath Authority is Cleveland's premier bath and shower remodeler. Experts and factory-trained installers, you give them a call now at 216-220-8399. You get 500 bucks off your next custom bath or shower remodel. You can also go to thebathauthority.com where affordability meets quality. A huge selection of bath projects, all made in the United States. Your bathroom, outstanding. In about a day, superior products and expert installers at thebathauthority.com, 216-220-8399. Some noteworthy things there. We have captains. 
So that's the first time under Stefanski that we've had yeah, five of captains, them. five named captains, as voted on by the team, Joel Batonio, Nick Chubb, Miles Garrett, Anthony Walker Jr., and then Charlie Hewitt, who will be joining us a little bit later in the Love program, Charlie. joining it as well. So those would be the five. Uh, what do you make of that? Anything? Time for a change? What, what do you, you know, think? It's later interesting, about? and one of the things you'll hear when we uh, play my interview with Charlie later on is, is – you know, he said it's different. It's, it's a different vibe. It's a cohesive team. And I think that's something that, you know, this team under Kevin Stefanski for the first time get, has a normal locker room situation. They mm -hmm. really know each other. Uh, they like hanging out with each other in and out of the building. And so I think that it was probably something the players said, look, we want to pick some leaders and, and honor the guys that are, you know, we want to be our leaders on and off the field. And I don't think it's any surprise who was chosen. Batonio, Nick Chubb on the defensive side, Miles Garrett. Now people might be surprised about Anthony Walker, but if you are around the team and you see it, he is the leader of the defense. And I even talked to him about that when we interviewed. I interviewed him a week. I would say within the last two weeks. Yeah, I interviewed Anthony Walker before I think the uh, the preseason finale there against the Bears. He is the leader. He is beloved by everybody on that side of the ball. He does everything the right way. And so you get him and then Charlie Hewlett, you know, the last time we had captains, he was the special teams captain in 2019. He's a special teams captain again this year. And so, you know, it does. That's I think that's a great group. Doesn't surprise me in any way, shape or form. You've got great leadership. You've got great production. You know, Walker was our leading tackler a year ago. Yeah. Over 100 tackles. Um, and so there you go. I think it speaks to, you know, how far Miles has come. It's you know you usually best player and he's our best player, um, and and but there's more than that. He, you know he really has taken a leadership face of the franchise role this summer and through camp. Yeah. We've noted that several times. And then Nick, who doesn't say anything ever, but just do it as I do it. Yep. You know, and so when your best players are Nick Chubb and Miles Garrett, there is it's pretty easy for people to follow them because they're doing all the stuff the right way. Yeah. So I, I think that's a big moment for, for them. And then, obviously, Joel, you want to talk about one of our best players, certainly among them as well, when you think about that. Um, I think the other thing that I wanted to circle back to, you mentioned how close this team is. This, as we talked about yesterday with Paul DePodesta, and as we've talked about a lot over the course of this offseason, it's been very tough. It's been a tough offseason. There's been a lot going on. Um, but I do think that it has caused this team – with a very much us against the world mentality sure. or bunker in mentality. I think that that was evident in camp. Um, and it isn't necessarily just the notion of like, I, I don't want that to be misconstrued into like, Hey, we're right there. Nothing like that. But just like we got each other's back. Sure. While all this noise is going on out here, we got each other's back. And I, I noticed that in camp. And I think that maybe that plays into this a little bit too. I, I completely agree. They are very unified. Uh, you know, you'll hear again, like I said, from Charlie, he thinks this is a team that has a chance to, to be something special. And now to be something special other than a g group of guys that really likes each other, you've got to win. And so that is the task, obviously. The Browns looking to win a week one game for the first time since 2004, which Gosh, when you think wild, about it is it? staggering. Yeah. So the second longest streak ever is eight games. The Colts have a current streak at eight games tied with three others. That's second longest ever. The Browns are at 17 Oh, sixteen 16 and one in that span. Of course, the tie with the Steelers in 2018 in the rain, low those many years ago. But this is a team that is, you know, certainly it, it has a chance. It does feel like there is a brotherhood. It does feel like there is a collective unity amongst this team with a common goal and common purpose. But you, get, you still got to go out there and do it. And so this is the time for this football team to go out and do that. And they'll be led by Jacoby Brissett, who, as you said, we'll hear from his media session today. Uh, and he's, you know, he's red hot. Two-game winning streak as a starter. Yeah. So maybe we can get to three in a row. Let's uh, go. Other thing of note there, the notion that uh, Jadavian Clowney is out today with illness, yes. but nothing expected Not more than that. Serious. No. Uh, at that. So the players back in the building today as they practice ahead of Sunday's opener against Carolina. Um, it is an opener, as we t said off the top, if you, if you missed, we joined a little early so we could hit coach on time. It's an opener that's made for professional wrestling, honestly, yes, with, with exactly all of what it. You're saying. We were saying that off the top. It had that feel. Uh, you mentioned Flair, and I, I immediately went there. Well, this is fitting because it, it has all of that. It's one of those ones that we've used the word referendum. I think that that's fair. I think there's a lot of juice to it here locally, probably even more so than there is in, in Charlotte. I actually saw a, um, a, a graphic of the highest price tickets in the NFL, and they are as you expected they would be. I think the highest price ticket in the NFL this weekend is Broncos and and Seahawks yeah, okay. with 
Russ Wilson's trip back there. Pretty wild, by the way, that the NFL did that. Did Wilson at Broncos in, in week or Broncos at Wilson at Seattle? Yeah. In week one. Sure. Um, and then the idea that I, I think Rams Bills was up there. We were ninth, ninth highest ticket. This is a pretty nondescript game from a non Browns non Baker story perspective. Like there's really good divisional. I mean, heck in our division, the Steelers play the Bengals this week. And that was up there too. I want to say it was seventh. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you just, if the Baker aspect wasn't in this, I don't think this is the ninth best game of the week as proof by who's on the call necessarily not a shot at them, but that's not the A team. So Browns fans travel. It is a travel. Well, it's, that's it. It's a travel. I'm guessing game. that we're, you will see a lot of orange. Oh, t- I know tons. I know. Tons of people who are going this game. Yeah. Tons. As yeah. if it's it's going to feel kind of, I think, almost like in some ways a home game. And there is juice to it. This is a deeply personal game to the quarterback of the Carolina Panthers, who was a Cleveland Brown. And again, I, I go through all these things. That, what can all be true? It can be that he's been the best quarterback we've had since, you know, Bernie. Yeah. And it can also be true that the Browns felt they need to upgrade the quarterback position, which they went out and they did, you know. It can be true that he's the best quarterback the Browns have had. It can also be true he, nobody in the NFL has thrown more interceptions than him since 2018, since mm-hmm. he came into the league. He's thrown 56. And the Browns wanted to get, obviously, an elite quarterback, Deshaun Watson. Uh, they wanted to get in Jacoby Brissett, a, a guy that will not do that, is in no danger to lead the league in interceptions. Um, and so that that's really the plan, and that's the way that they plan on operating. And so, yeah, it's going to be personal to him. It's going to be personal – I think on some level to some players, certainly in this organization, they're going to be professional about it, but it is, this is a game that's got some juice to it. I mean, yeah. there's just no way, other way to say it. It's got some juice to it and that's okay. Yeah. That's I good. Think it'll, I mean, every television Northeast Ohio is on this. Oh yeah. Sunday. And the numbers for this are going to be crazy around here. Not in a, not in Southern Ohio. Sad. Well, Cincinnati would be, they would be showing Bengals, Bengals and Steelers yeah, naturally. Of Ohio. Central. Central. Perhaps. No. Yeah. Well, look, they're in a tough spot because, so it's the only, mar- we've, we've got tweeted about this. What, you know, can you help us in Columbus? Look, they're in a tough spot. It's the only city in the country that is equal distant between two NFL franchises within the same state that occupy the same division, i.e. they're on the same network. Every other scenario like this it's either, you know, if it's in Florida, your Bucks or your Dolphins. Sure. If you're in Dallas, your Texans, not that there's any Texans fans, your Texans or your Cowboys. Yep. You see, th- this is the only one. G- Giants, Jets are AFC, Giants are NFC. Same thing in Philly, Pittsburgh and the Eagles. One's one, one's the opposite. This is the only situation like this. You have a city that's in the middle of the state that's equal distance from both, yep. and they're in the same division. So they... I used to work at that station, and you you would have to make this decision every week. And the rule of thumb in Columbus was this. If it was Browns and Bengals, Browns always won. And so we would always show Browns. Even if the Bengals were better, and in many instances they were. This is the Dalton, sure. A.J. Green. Yep. You'd show Browns anyway because that's what the audience demanded. If it was Bengals versus Steelers, that would trump Browns. And because would the Ravens combinations, well? no, 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 just Steelers. No, there's a lot of Steelers fans in Columbus. Yeah, so it. the combination of of Steelers and Bengals head to head trumps yeah. Browns independently. Yep. So it, they're in a brutal spot. In fact, a unique spot to the rest of the country. But that's the thinking, and I don't blame them. I I understand sure. why they're doing what they're doing. It's a it's Bengals a tough spot. The Super Bowl. Yeah, they did. And by the way, they got a kid from the viewing area starting at quarterback, who's pretty likable. Um. Hard knocks last night. Did you take it in? Of course. Yeah. It's good. I thought it was cool how they followed some of the guys that first time I've didn't seen make that. it and then landed up somewhere else, like David Blau and mm-hmm. uh and Pimpleton. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was I thought very captivating and I thought, you know, the end with Campbell were the team that, you know, that can and will. Boy, I, that I, was something. I, that was wasn't good. It? And yeah. he's He's the real deal, and I felt like watching his interactions, even with the guys that they cut and the guys, you know, we want to bring back on the practice squad, and the way that everybody responded to them, he and the general manager, you know, about I can see what you guys are trying to build here, and you know what you're doing, allowing men to be men and to be, you know, themselves mm-hmm. but in in the framework of this team. I thought it was cool. I, I'm. This is a, a rare edition of Hard Knocks. And, look, I've always liked Goff, California kid, and, and I liked him in that draft. And he's taking the Rams to the Super Bowl and was, you know, cast aside. And 
which is to me the person if there's any quarterback that could ever have a grievance in the league it would be him him but he doesn't because he's hmm. he's a very mild-mannered guy uh, but I thought the series was effective at making me interested and and I honest root rooting for the Detroit Lions. Like I'd like to see them have a surprise awesome year. I think that'd be a lot of fun. I think they did a pivot, and you're not always going to be this way. I mean, God knows they had Mike White as a coach of the Falcons a few years oh ago, and that's goodness. a debacle. But but, that was a debacle. But if you have a coach, there aren't many instances where you could do this, like you do it in Tennessee. But if you have a coach who's willing to do this stuff, that is far more fascinating than following nondescript player. Yeah. And in some cases, as in last year with Dallas, it wasn't that interesting with Dak and Zeke. We know so much about those guys that as they were following around, it wasn't anything that you didn't kind of already know. So I, I think Campbell is unique. But, yeah, I'm with you. I thought I thought that that was a big, a big highlight of it. I'll be rooting for them. I think they're an easy team to root for. One last thing on it. Wasn't Eminem awkward? Super awkward. Strange. It was like he was trying to act tough. Like he's got to be fifty, doesn't he? It was. I thought. It was, I thought it was a very bizarre turn. For Wasn't Eminem. it weird? Like yes. he. So he shows up in like a lion's colored hoodie or something, dressed like Eminem, and then he was like saying he was rooting for the team. He very clearly had watched Hard Knocks, and apparently he must have like a spaghetti company. Yeah, or he does mom's spaghetti. Mom's spaghetti. So he does that up there. So he brought that in to, to feed the team, and so there. You know, you're having this conversation. And then he, um, like when he would talk to a player about some sort of football feat, he would act as if he could do it. As I said, any position, I'm great. Any position, I'm great. I, I did like, like when the one coach came over and wouldn't stop shaking, shaking his, his hand. hand. He's like, are we going to, how long are we, we going to do this? this? <laughs> like that I thought was actually was funny. funny. Yeah, that was good. He was but he was very that. awkward. I would agree. I, thought, I, I agree with that. Eminem What's our age on him? 49 years uh, old. 50, I thought. Yeah, it had to be. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that, that was, was that was interesting. Slings, that was odd. And he's slinging spaghetti now. They also had a in in that scene. I don't know if you guys picked up on this. I love when NFL teams have like their logo history in meeting rooms and stuff. Okay, you know where I'm going with this. Go, and then I I'm sure I'm going to jump on. So <laughs> they show their logo history. I had no idea they got a logo with an old time NFL player like yielding lions bring it back where is that bring thing? it back did that I not said, was that not an attention getter i wanted i said that to to miss k i was like i put that, that on a hoodie let's go so like amazing it kind of looked like i couldn't tell if he was you know running in the midst of them like three lions on leashes that he was running or if he was almost like on a ben-hur chariot i couldn't tell either. lions were pulling like what either way so in it was awesome awesome like, that was the coolest logo. How is that not on? I mean, they should be selling stuff with that on. Put it on. It's I, awesome. Talking to my guys at Homage, like, get that thing on T-shirts. That like, thing was awesome. I also feel like the iconography, if I said that right. Sure. Iconography. I think Sort so. of. Iconography yeah. of the lion that is permeates their building and all the different lions, like real lions, their lion, like photos, posters, whatever. I'm into all of it. I think that it's just like it's a sweet vibe for uh yeah because they have like the ones where it's like the real where lion. it's a real lion some are their lions yeah it's, right. I thought it, it looks awesome. like it's a guy jumping oh maybe like the lions are lead blocking for the player yeah. maybe yeah they're lead blocking for him so i mean it's awesome it's amazing it's, it, it's an a plus so it funny in the last night it felt like it was multiple lions but now that i'm seeing it up close it's really just one what yeah it's like it's, three lions i thought it night. was three but it I think it's – isn't it just one lion? Huh, yeah, because the different manes, I guess, the from far look like The manes make it look like, like it's multiple. several. But I, either way, it's amazing. I'd like it to be three lions. Three lions would be ideal. Yeah, I'm with you. I like it's, – it's an easy sell. It's, it's really amazing that they've had really the least amount of success in the NFL over the last 60 years of any team, any franchise. Because yeah. they've got – it feels like everything – stability everywhere, a great brand, great colors, all of it. But it just – it hasn't worked. All right, Elk and Elk, serious lawyers, serious injuries. Call 1-800-ELK-OHIO for a free case review. Elk and Elk's a proud partner of your Cleveland Browns. Coming up next, we will meet the 2022 Carolina Panthers. Z has got copious notes, so you're going to learn a lot here coming up next. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Authority and has been free for the entire month of August. If you like what you saw, read, and heard, now it's time to subscribe for Brown Season at thelandondemand.com. Watch your favorite shows in the new HD quality video. Follow the season with Tony Grossi's columns, the Daily Grossi podcast, the 100 Years Pod. Hear your favorite shows on demand without commercial interruptions. Go to thelandondemand.com to subscribe to day and time to meet the carolina panthers our first of the season buddy and for that we bring on dr z who's got notes and boards oh baby we got a lot of stuff here so carolina panthers last year five and twelve they were a unique team and that they were the only team that had a top three offense and a, bo- a top three defense and a bottom three offense which they had last year they were the number two overall total defense in the nfl the browns by the way fifth in total defense a year ago they were fourth in the passing defense uh third in yards per play so they were elite there so what was their achilles heel why were they not good enough well they were 30th in the red zone and they did not force many takeaways 26th in terms of takeaways in fact for opposing quarterbacks for being as good of a pass defense as they were opposing quarterbacks had a quarterback rating of 100.8 against them and threw 26 touchdowns with only nine picks but this is a very good back end of the defense I imagine those picks will go up with JC Horn back healthy so this is a team strength of it is the defense no doubt about it that's where they are you know that's where they make their hay however it's an offense that isn't bad and throw last year's stats out the window you know they did not have Christian McCaffrey last year for the majority of the season Uh, And here's the thing. Christian McCaffrey was worth with McCaffrey last year. They averaged 20 points a game and 321 total yards without him. 16 points and 283 total yards. So he was worth four points and 40 yards of offense a game, which is quite a bit, a pretty staggering figure there for Christian McCaffrey. He, um, they were four and three with McCaffrey last year. They were one and nine without him. So he makes a difference uh, for this football team. Um, from 2017 to 19, 5,443 scrimmage yards. That was most in the NFL. That's not a surprise. Since 2019, he averages 136.6 scrimmage yards per game and one touchdown per game. Those are That's both most in the NFL. Um, so Only we, 10 games the last two years from him and just 26 it. years of age. That's it. Only 10 games. That's, that's amazing. right. He's 10 missed games tw- in two years. 23 out of the last 33 games after not missing anything Mm -mm. to start his career. And so he's very important for them. The other big name to know on offense is DJ Moore. And you and I were talking in the break about this. DJ Moore is a flat out stud folks, and he can line up anywhere uh, on the field. If you were to look at and and ask yourself, okay, there are three people in the NFL. Let's hear Gibbe. You want to do some guess the stats? Let's dance. All right, Gibbe. (laughs) three people in the NFL with 1,100 or more receiving yards in each of the last three seasons. Can you name them? Only three. Three receivers? Players. One's not a receiver, which helps you. McCaffrey. No, he's been hurt. (laughs) Never mind. Strip that. Three players. (laughs) 1,100 yards receiving in each of the last three seasons. That's all. That's all. That's the threshold. Cooper Cup. Okay. Uh, Devontae Adams. Okay. One's not a receiver. Travis Kelsey. Okay, so you went one for three there. Travis Kelsey is correct. Mm -hmm. The other two are Stephon Diggs and DJ Moore. I wouldn't have had more. I mean, it's meet the Panthers. I probably should have gone down that road, but in no way, shape, or form. I did set it up pretty well for you that it was going to be DJ (laughs) Moore. But in no way, shape, or form would that name have crossed my mind on that. No, I don't think it would have for me either. I mean, when you were going through that in the break, I I thought it was stupefying what he's done and was completely unaware and juxtaposed to the quarterbacks he's throwing to him. It's even more impressive. Since 2009, here are your leaders in the – since 2019, I'm sorry, here are your leaders in the NFL in receiving yards. Cooper Cup, one. Devontae Adams, two. Stephon Diggs, three. Travis Kelsey, four. DJ Moore, five, which is an incredible thing. He actually had more receiving yards last year than all the other wide receivers on Carolina combined. So that's the focus of this team. You have those two, Robbie Anderson. He can still hit you over the top. He's a big play wide receiver. Um, And then the question will be, you know, can they protect Baker Mayfield last year on offense? This was not a good team. They gave up the fourth most sacks in the NFL. They were dreadful. They're dreadful in every category, honestly. They were last in yards per play, 30th in in total offense, 29th in scoring, 29th in passing, 29th in third down, 28th in sacks, 29th in uh, 
turn or was giveaways. They were dreadful. It's a new team, though. Add in McCaffrey. Baker Mayfield is now the quarterback, which is an upgrade on Sam Darnold. DJ Moore, Terrence Marshall's healthier. You bring in Hollywood Higgins. They drafted on the offensive line their first uh, first pick, Ekem Equano out of North Carolina State, sixth overall in this draft. They brought in Austin Corbett, former Brown, on a big contract, as well as Bradley Bozeman, the center of the Baltimore Ravens. So they've made some moves there, but this is a team that I think is going to win in a similar fashion to the Cleveland Browns, playing good defense. They are excellent in the back end. You think about Adoree Jackson, J.C. Horn. You've got C.J. Henderson. you got Jeremy Chin, Xavier Woods. You know, these are all early draft picks. Oh, yeah. Jeremy Horn Chin, was a superstar before he got hurt last year, too. He was, was great. His trajectory was crazy. And then, you know, Jeremy Chin was second in the defensive player rookie of the year voting yeah. two years ago. They're strong safety. So that's good. Brian Burns, their leading pass rusher, pro bowler last year, nine sacks in each of the last two seasons. But he's only 250. And they play a true 4-3. You can run the football at him. I expect the Browns to do that. I expect the Browns to try to power it down his throat. And then they lost Hassan Reddick. I think that is a big, big loss for them. Last year, he led the team with 11 sacks. Stepping up into his place will be Yatur Gross Matos uh, out of Penn State, who last year as a – I'm sorry, he was drafted in 2020, two years ago, second-round pick. Only 12 pressures last year, three-and-a-half sacks. The chances of turning 25% of your pressures into sacks in the NFL is very rare, just to give you like a comp – uh, standpoint, you know, Burns had the nine sacks on 51 pressures, whereas basically one for every three of Gross Matos has went for a sack of some kind. That's unlikely to be there. He struggles against the run. He's only 265. So this is not a big defensive end room in terms of their ability to hold up against the run. So that's something that I would look for for the Browns to really attack them there. Um, they got Derek Brown in the middle, former first round pick. Matt Ioannidis, uh, where they brought in as a free agent who. If you go back to 2018 and 19 from the interior when he was with Washington, he had 16 sacks in those two years. Hmm. Injured in 2020, last year a little bit of a down year, but in the preseason certainly was making some moves. So it's a team that is going to rely on its defense. It is a team that the Browns must be prepared for the blitz. Last year they blitzed on all downs, 37% fourth most in the NFL. They blitzed 40% of the time on first down, fourth most in the NFL, and 40% of the time on third down. Yeah. So they are not afraid to heat you up and to heat you up on early downs. And for a Browns team, you know, you have to be cognizant of that when you run a lot of your play action on first downs as we do. We take a lot mm -hmm. of shot plays. Those take time. And so you've got to be ready for those blitzes. That's something I think that'll be an interesting part uh, of the chess match in this one. But strong defense, kind of unknown offense. McAdoo first year as the coordinator. What's that going to look like? I think they're going to try to get the ball out of his hands very, very quickly. And the Browns are going to have to be ready for McCaffrey and DJ Moore. That's that's where the ball is going to go more often than not. And the interesting thing was, though, in the preseason, 73% of Baker's targets were to running backs and tight ends, not wide receivers. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't really well, getting the ball to DJ similar Moore. was here similar times, here. Yeah, you know? no doubt. So that's something to keep an eye on here. DJ Moore and that production and how that relationship goes as we've seen some of the issues with wide receivers here in our building with with Baker. All right, a couple of things as you were going through all of that sure. because, I, you know, you're always interested from a franchise construction standpoint, where are you? This is a team that when Matt Rule was hired, David Tepper, the owner, buys Carolina. His, his hire is Matt Rule. He gives him – he's the hot coaching candidate at the moment. He's at Baylor at the time. They'd come off a great season and a great run where he'd rebuilt built Baylor um, on the fly and made him relevant very quickly. Gives him the keys to the kingdom, a lot of money, and away we go. Well, the way that they built it – was with defense through the draft. I mean, they would draft defensive line, defensive players time and time again in the early parts of these drafts to try to amplify what they already had offensively. The next very clear path that they tried to do was acquired to Sean Watson. And this was two years ago. They yep. were in on Watson, all in on Watson. There was a ton of whispers before Watson, you know, even as he had first asked for the trade or there was any sort of, this was going into last season, that Carolina was going to do everything it could. They were rebuffed, so they pivot. Sam Darnold is who it is. So they go Darnold. That doesn't go well, right? Nope. So they get through the end of this season, and what do they try to do again? Well, it's a familiar tone. They go back for Deshaun Watson. All yep. in to get Deshaun Watson again. That doesn't work again. So they draft Matt Corral. Out of Trade U up to get Matt Corral. Trade up to get Matt Corral out of, out of Ole Miss. And then, and then go get Baker Mayfield, all because they missed out on Watson twice. 
Now, one thing happened in camp that I think is pretty interesting, and I don't think that this should be that surprising for people around here who enjoyed Baker. Baker had a really good camp, and he's a fun guy to be around when the going's good. It's great front runner. And so the Elite. the idea here is the the acquisite Baker coming in there and being better than I think they thought that he would be changed kind of their view of this season because before the Mayfield acquisition, this very clearly was a team that even in an NFC that is wide open. They were not a playoff contender in any way, and I don't think they fashioned themselves that way. It felt like they were going to play out this string, maybe move, move off of Matt Rule, maybe go with Matt Corral in a year from now, who knows, or position themselves to draft another quarterback next year. Yep. Baker changed that with the way that he played in camp. And so that leads them now to think, hey, with the break here or there, and you're going through all of this, and they've got a lot of talent on defense, they've got some good weapons on offense, if McCaffrey can stay healthy, you can almost talk yourself into this being a playoff team in the NFC, which – 45 days ago you would have said no chance no chance and that's right the nfc is wide open they do have some players of consequence on both sides of the ball and yeah that's that's where they're at now what's amazing too about the acquisition of baker mayfield after the acquisition of darnold after the failed acquisitions of watson and the acquisition of matt corral is that darnold's out six weeks and matt corral's done for the season yeah so it's baker mayfield and then pj walker is the backup quarterback now for the Carolina Panthers. So it ended up being very good fortune for them that they even got Baker. Even Baker's mentality has changed dramatically. He went from a placeholder to now maybe he could be there three years. Who knows? I mean, Who knows? Corral has a – it's a big injury for Matt Corral. Yeah. So who knows what this could look like for him? So there's a sense of rejuvenation, rebirth, whatever, renaissance for everybody involved in this thing down there. I still think they're really limited. Same. Um, so, you know, it's, I fully expect us to win. I know we're not the favorite right now, but I, I will get to our picks later in the week, but, um, I just think it's fascinating how they've had to pivot by my count five times in a year Yeah, in terms of their strategy and their plan. Yeah. Let's not forget Cam Newton was back in there for a, oh, that's right. a hot second. <laughs> yeah. Last Cause year. they had injuries last year. Yeah. And it was Cam. I mean, it went from if Darnold's healthy and Corral's not injured, it's very like they always do that thing. Who's the first quarterback to get benched or whatever? Not necessarily even because it would have been a production, just because you wanted to see other people. Carolina absolutely would have been on that list with Baker for before sure. That. Now they're not because there's no. He is else though. He's it. still like fourth, which Was I wish you fourth? could like op short the odds. They're not benching they're not him for PJ Walker. For PJ Walker. There's nothing no. to see there. No. No. It's, rid it's a ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Number one, I think is Trubisky. It's like Trubisky's one. Mariota because of Ritter. Mariota, right. Um, Tannehill's even on the list. Well, I can see that because the um, Malik uh, it was very exciting in the preseason. Malik Willis, Malik Willis, yeah, blanket on him that he would be a guy who could get in there. Sure. There's not many of those situations out there. I would imagine. Baco Nation. Look at the nation. The Look nation. At him. This guy's All earbuds of in. Of course he does. He's smiling, focused. striding. Of course, always Ooh. in a good mood. That guy. Huh? Always a nice stride. Nice dancing. A little dance. What a win. Does he think? Does he know we can still see him, or do you think he had gotten around the corner? I think he thought he got yeah, around the corner. Good. I think he doesn't yeah. realize yeah. the angle. Yeah. Ah, oh, there, there he is. is. Yes, yes, very good, very good. Who's the game Big there? Drew. Doing Tom? Oh, Big Drew's in there too. Big Drew's in there oh, too. Oh my god! Yeah. The meeting of the of the all the meetings of the minds. The yeah. our very best people. Our very best people. No doubt. Out. Yeah, absolutely. Pause up, Drew. It's all coming soon. Yeah. So it's a. It is a fun game. The Baker aspect to it takes it to an 11. Go ahead. One interesting thing to note, and, you know, we talked about the three phases of the game, is that this is a team that brought in Andre Roberts, who's a multiple-time Pro Bowl returner, an all-pro returner. Um, they signed Johnny Hecker, who mm -hmm. is considered by many to be the best punter in the game and also somebody you absolutely have to watch out for in fake punt situations. That's what he's done so well with the Rams for all of those years. So that's those are a couple of guys you got to keep an eye on there. They did have Zane Gonzalez, their kicker. He got hurt in the preseason, so Zane Gonzalez is out for them as the kicker uh, right now. So just, again, that's kind of where it looks – that's how it looks for the, uh, the Carolina Panthers. A team that, right, does have a little bit of hope, but the truth of the matter is <clears throat> they downgraded their pass rush. Mm-hmm significantly reddick for your tar gross matos is a significant downgrade they are healthier on the back end which is good they were not a great run defense last year and i think that's where the browns are going to attack them burns they are undersized at the defensive end position and so i think that's where in our wide zone scheme we are going to try to attack them at the edges and punish those smaller defensive ends you ought to be able to maul them in, in both lines of scrimmage that's, i don't know how they're going to block miles and yes and Jadevian, and i don't know how 
they're not going to be blocked by our offensive line in the ground game. So that's that's the roadmap. Uh, and honestly, it'll probably be a familiar one as we continue on. Coming up here in the second hour of the program, we'll go around the league. Big news out of Chicago with their stadium building and what could be being done there. We could have a different starter than we anticipated week two against the Jets. We'll get to that. Jacoby Prezet at the top of the hour. Charlie Hewitt at the bottom. You listen to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Rumpke Waste Recycling, family owned and operated. Whether you join them as a customer or an employee, you'll become part of the family. Visit Rumpke.com to learn more. And now here's your week one starting quarterback, Jacoby Brissett at the podium. Let's have a listen. Hey, Jacoby, how much can- You're down. Seven minutes. Uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Kevin's been preaching to us. Uh, got to make sure we come out and get out to a fast start. Uh, you know, and, and, and this is our first one. So uh, we got to be ready to go. We know they're going to be ready to go. Uh, I think everybody's emotions will be high because it is the first game of the season. Uh, we got to do a really good job of controlling ours and, and sticking to our fundamentals and technique and playing good football. There is a lot of buzz, obviously, you know, versus Baker and all that kind of stuff. What role can you play in, in, in doing what you just talked about and kind of keeping those emotions contained? Uh, I think it's the Browns versus the Panthers, um, and that's just what it is. You know, it's, it's nameless faceless opponents. It's been kind of a, a unique training camp for you guys. Uh, you know, you, you only started getting first team reps in the middle of August. Now, how prepared do you feel going into this game? And are you looking forward to, you know, playing with the first all the first team guys in an actual game? When in a preseason game, there's just a few. Of them uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing. You know, another game in the National Football League. You know, and and uh, these don't come by easy. Uh, so. Uh, definitely uh, very appreciative of the opportunities that uh, have been presented uh, and, and just look forward to going out there and playing good football and taking care of the business. And you feel prepared, ready to go? Yes, sir. I mean, we still got another week, but yeah. You talked after the, the last preseason game about, you, you know, you wanted, you still felt like you had more to grow into the offense. How do you feel like you, you, you have with these last couple of weeks? Uh, I think I've grown, but uh, still more room for improvement. Obviously, uh, a new week, a new opponent uh, that present different uh, you know, problems and, and things that we have to take care of. So um, looking forward to it. How do you go about preparing for a defense where it, it's week one, not a lot of preseason tape to really be able to dissect and, and glean from? So just how, how do you prepare for Carolina's defense with, with limited uh, tape? Uh, you know, just trusting our rules. Uh, you know, obviously, like you said, I mean, it's limited, but it's still some out there. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and just going to play good football, uh, making sure that you know, more than I know what they're doing, I know what we're doing and why we're doing it, uh, and then go from there. What challenges do they present? Uh, I mean, they're a good defense. Uh, you know, I got, got a lot of good players. Obviously, getting JC back helped them a lot. Um, you know, and, and uh, Shaq's will be out there. So, uh, you know, they present uh, a lot of problems, but, you know, I think we're up for the test. Jacoby, on game day, how do you find your center? What unique ways do you do throughout the day to get grounded? I thought you were talking about the actual center. Just to kind of calm everything and take in the moment and not let it become bigger than it is. Uh, I think it comes with preparation throughout the week. Uh, And uh, look, I mean, we're all going to have those uh, emotions uh, at kickoff. I mean, that's every game. That's uh, probably every player uh, because we have a pulse. Uh, But I mean, it it comes with the preparation throughout the week, uh, you know, and, and we'll figure that out when we get to that point. But, you know, today it starts with today. So with your either career or specifically here, is there something that you really emphasize to say, if, if I do this or something, we're going to win this game? Is there anything like that? Uh, I'm more, more so if I just be myself. Uh, if I can take care of myself and, and, and do my job and putting the guys in the right position uh, and understanding our plan, uh, then outcomes to take care of themselves. So, so you call me you about Baker, uh, chatter, noise, talk in this game, arrivals, pregame, all that sort of stuff. I wasn't here with him last year, so I don't care, <laughs> really. And during the, you know, pregame or during the game, I mean, do you feel like you won't have a very hard time kind of blocking any of that? No. Jacoby, do you wish you had more uh, preseason game action? Uh, like I said uh, previously, I mean, we, we, we've had a plan together. Uh, and I think our uh, training camp practices uh, reflected uh, our plan. Uh, and, and like I said, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Uh, got another good week of preparation coming up, and, and when Sunday gets here, we'll we'll be ready to go. Jacoby, as a quarterback, if you were playing in your former team like Baker is, do you think that would give you a distinct advantage knowing the both the offensive and defensive system? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know what's going through his head right now. Uh, I mean, I can only speak for myself, and it's just, hey, I'm, go out there, be prepared, and be ready. Hey, Jacoby, I know you guys always say when you look back, if you always prepare like you're the starter. But hasn't it, isn't it any different since you knew when you were assigned in, in March that you would be the, the starting quarterback in this game? So what's the question? Is, is, is it different than, as you always say, backups always say, 
prepare like you would start? Uh, no, it's no no different. Uh, I mean, you just prepare, you know. When they um when they come and put the game plan in, how much input do you have? Do they come to you and say, "What do you like here?" It's, you know. Uh, definitely. I I mean, uh, we we've obviously been building up this uh, you know, this menu of, of plays uh, to see what I like and and I mean, because obviously if. I mean, if I can't run it and other players, not just me, other players can't run the plays, then we won't run them. Uh, so I think uh, Kevin is doing a good job of, of, of listening to those opinions. Obviously, it's some plays where you got to say, hey, you know what I mean? You got to learn it. Uh, but, uh, you know, as the week pro progresses, that's how uh, more comfortable you get with plays. So, um, so yeah. Jacoby, you've been, in, you've been through this experience before taking over a new team to start the year very early in the year. Is there anything unique about this one experience so far? Uh, it's the one that I have today. Um, that's the most unique thing about it. That's all I can, you know, really think about is just going out there and just doing my best. What kind of luxury is it having Nick and Kareem behind you? Uh, I'm excited to see him play. Uh, you know, obviously been played against the, the, the Browns a couple of times, but been on the op opposing side of it. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good feeling when they're back there. So I just, I'm excited to watch him play. How dangerous can Kareem be as a receiver? It seems like that was has kind of been a little on tap. I mean, well, you know, not by you, but, you know, just seems like he's he could break one at any moment. Kind of uh, potential. I mean, Kareem's a good player. Uh, you know, very fortunate uh, to 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 have him on this on this offense and be a part of this. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm looking forward to thirty. You know, he presents a lot of different problems. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm excited. Jacoby, do you find it motivating at all that it, it seems like maybe nationally and even locally, uh, people seem to have dialed back. I haven't heard anything, so I don't really care, to be honest. Sorry. Do you make a point of not caring? Attention? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just wondering, uh, you know, your relationship with ourselves, and you've been in communication with them. Last one here. Is he giving you any advice? Uh, I have not talked to him this week yet. You're up. If you so you listen to Jacoby there, it's he is so ready for this and so prepared for this. You think of the hot buttons he's he been in already with Brady and Luck, and now he is absolutely prepared for this. He's a pro in every way, shape, or form. Um, yeah. <laughs> that yes, was, that was good. That's that exactly good. right. Yes, it, it, he is. He is ready. He is not. No matter how badly there are people that want him to get fired up about the drama of a quarterback that he never shared a locker room with, he's not going to do it. He is going to be ready to play. They will have a game plan put in place that I think will be very, very good. They're going to try to get after you know these linebackers in coverage. They're going to try to run the ball at these defensive ends, who, as we talked about earlier, are a little light to be true for three defensive ends, but that also helps make them be very effective you know, in their ability to get after the quarterback. But that's what they're going to do. I mean, this is not, to me, this is not a big deal. This is not a game that where it's going to be too big for him. This is not a situation where, you know, you're looking at it and saying, oh, man, is he going to be okay? Yeah, he's yep. going to be just fine. This is a guy that is considered to be one of the better backup quarterbacks in the NFL, and he is that for a reason. And the Browns have brought him in here to make sure that he can do that. And so that's that's the stated goal. That's what they're going to try to do. Yeah. There it is. Yeah, I I think the demeanor is perfect for it and the professionalism is perfect for it. And and I think that, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit in the when we were talking a little bit about Carolina. We've talked we, – you and I talked about it this morning. Um, he, he is – the layups are layups. Yes. And that's, he'll continue to do that, and he's not going to put you in a bad spot. So is is the arm talent such of of Deshaun? No, that's not what it is. He's not the type of player. Does he have? The, he's not a top five quarterback in the league. But what he is is somebody who can manage things, who can take what's given to him. If you think of Keenum last year, and even Baker when he's been at his best, he doesn't have the arm talent of Baker, obviously. But um, in terms of at his best, seeing things open, letting the ball go, Jacoby Brissett can do that. And I think yes. his personality really is a great fit for this team through these first. He, there's a calming. He's got a calming – he's the shaman. That's what they he call does. him, the yeah. shaman. So I think that they feel very comfortable with these things. And, look, 
this is going to be a very smartly designed game plan. Like if you're looking at the three corners for the the Panthers, the guy you're going to go after is C.J. Henderson. While he was a first yeah. round pick, a top ten pick for his career, he's given up seventy percent completions. He's given up uh, a quarterback rating of one hundred and twenty against. So J.C. Horn, on the other hand, was dominant before he got hurt last year. He only gave up one catch and he had a pick, <laughs> so he was pretty darn good. Yeah, but this is going to be a smartly designed game plan that is going to accentuate the strengths of Jacoby Brissett, minimize whatever deficiencies there may be, and that's how they're going to go about it. If they are able to control the, the time of possession, control the clock, control the turnover battle, mm -hmm. which is what Jacoby Brissett's here, they're going to win. Yep. Like, they're going to win. I know that this is not the same Panthers team as a year ago, but to me, this is one of the craziest stats that I've maybe ever seen in, in getting ready for one of these games. All right. Last year, Carolina, okay, five and zero oh, when they allowed fewer than fifteen points. Okay, if their opponent made it to fifteen points against them last mm -hmm. year, they were zero and twelve. <laughs> Only winless team in such games in the NFL. Zero and that's twelve wild. when they allowed fifteen. That's points. a low threshold too. Uh, Extremely yeah. low. Yeah. Yes. So, put some points on the board. We get into the twenties. I feel very good about our abilities to win this game. Browns fans and Browns players rather watch game film to prepare. Finding your dream yes. home is no different, and Cross Country Mortgage is a partner that's prepared you and prepped you to put you in a position to win. Reach out today at ccm.com. Equal housing opportunity, MNLS 3029 on that. We'll go around the league coming up next. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Bo here for my friends at Renew Home Exteriors, offering high-performance products that are durable, long-lasting, cost- and energy-saving to transform the look and efficiency of your home. Winter is coming, and don't go into winter with concerns about your roof. With Renew Home Exteriors, get a new roof installed in 7 to 10 days. No money down, and payments as low as 96 bucks a month, plus receive free gutter guards with your roof purchase. Beautify your home with premium siding and roofing products at lower prices with Renew Home Exteriors. Visit Renew Estimates. Dot com. As we go around the NFL, we will be hosting the Jets in our home opener week two. It will not be Zach Wilson. In fact, he will miss the first four weeks or first three weeks of the season, yep. um, including our game here. Robert Sala, the Jets head coach, breaking that today that Joe Flacco would get the start Sunday. That's against Baltimore, I believe. And then um, he would start game two, which would be here. So it's a big blow to the Jets. Uh, I think hopes and chances and and we're optimistic that maybe Zach Wilson would get to play but there was also at the time of the injury fear that he was going to be done for the year so yeah when bad, it happened but not maybe as soon as some hoped and I want to say it happened against the Eagles because I always remember watching that getting ready for that preseason game where he just kind of ran and his knee kind of mm-hmm. gave out and, and I think ultimately they are they're pleased with that so um, Joe Flacco's guy they think they can win a few games with uh, for the Browns, it'll be a very familiar quarterback opponent, not to this staff, as he's been long gone from Baltimore mm-hmm. for quite some time. Um, but that's the Browns are going to be facing three quarterbacks who are not the opening day starters for their franchises a year ago in the first three weeks. And I would go so far as say in the first four weeks. Not until Justin Herbert in week five will we play a guy who opened the season as the starter last year because week one is Baker. Yeah. Week two is now going to be Joe Flacco. Week three uh, with the Steelers is Mitch Trubisky. Trubisky. And week four will be Marcus Mariota in Atlanta. Yeah, that's so, pretty wild. Yeah, no continuity week until five. Justin Herbert week five. So Flacco wins the Super Bowl in 2012 in New Orleans. Um, and that is that was when he got paid. And at that point, that year, they, they had gone 10 and 6. Uh, or was that the year? 12, they went 12 and 4, 10 and 6. A couple of 12 and 4s and a 10 and 6. It was 12, wasn't it? 12 and 4. 2000, 2012 Two. season when they won the Super Bowl and they played down in New Orleans against San Francisco. And oh, won. baby. Yeah, it's the year the kid broke his leg. So that's two th- the 2012 season, yeah. the Super Bowl in 2013. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. after that, he got money because Dion was on the NFL post game show and said, time to pay this man and that kind of created all of he it. bet on himself he bet that as year, big as can be as right? big as can be yeah. and then goes and has i think the greatest playoff run in quarterback history from a statistical standpoint anyway it was yeah i'm looking what your super bowl champion yes 2000. 2012 yep season right yep. yeah no it would have been yeah 2012 season he gets paid and in that playoff i'm trying to pull it up real quickly here he was ridiculous in that playoffs. He didn't throw an interception. I remember that. And re- don't forget, they were almost out had it not been for Raheem Moore misses that ball that he throws over. Yeah, so he goes 4-0. He throws for 1,140 yards, 11 touchdowns, no picks, and a quarterback rating of 118 in that playoff run. 11 touchdowns, no picks. That's like Montana-esque. So they go – is Manning already on Denver at this point? Because they played both the Colts and the Broncos in the playoffs. I would say that he's not, that he's in no, Indy. No, he's in Indy. He's in Indy at that time. It, is that Tebow? No, Tebow was the year that they beat the Steelers for one second in the playoffs. No, 12 was Manning. That was Manning's so, first year. Okay, so his first year. Denver, he wins the MVP, he, and they lose. They were ahead, and remember, they all they had to do was not let him throw, like basically kind of a Hail Mary, and yes. he more – missing it really kind of derailed his career it did yeah that's it yep so they they go in yes so they andrew luck went 11 and 6 his rookie year in indy so they beat he beats luck manning brady and then kaepernick and the 49ers in the super bowl who at that point was the ultimate weapon like nobody knew what to do with cap that was his first year yeah kind of starting he took it halfway through the year and nobody knew how to handle him and then they they won that game. By the way, Peyton responded to, responded to that in 2013 by throwing for 5,500 yards and 55 touchdowns. Was that good? Is that? I think it's that good. Seems pretty that good. Seems pretty good. In 16 games, it feels like a, a ten interceptions. Pretty, in case pretty, you're keeping a score at home. 55 touchdowns to, to ten games. to ten. God, <laughs> <laughs> so silly. That is. That's absurd. Yeah, yeah. That very much is. 
All right, uh, Emmanuel Sanders announces his retirement today as well. Go ahead. Well, in the words of the great movie Major League, we'll cross him off the list then. Yeah. That was a name that people had, you know, we had bandied about or others had bandied about as making a potential return. Interesting that he retires as a Denver Bronco. Mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to do that, and he was a part of, obviously, very good Denver Broncos teams. He was part of very good uh, Buffalo Bills teams. He was part of a very good 49ers team, uh, and he was with Pittsburgh at the, or to start his career. His best three-year stretch, though, came in Denver. Three straight 1,000-yard seasons, two Pro Bowl appearances uh, from 14, 15, and 16 there with, of course, Peyton Manning. His first year there, 1,404 and 9. Pretty good. By the way, Jeremy Fowler tweets this out. Yep. The 2022 all-retirement team, pretty impressive. QB, Roethlisberger. Running backs, Frank Gore, Chris Carson, James White. Wide receivers, Amendola and Sanders. Tight ends, Gronkowski and Jack Doyle, Andrew Whitworth, Brandon Brooks, Alex Mack, J.C. Treader. Good offensive line. Allie yeah. Marpet, Mitchell Schwartz, Al Villanueva, and Richie Mark. Incognito. Wow. Really good Especially offensive line. Offense. That's incredible on the offensive line. On the defense, the defensive line is Ryan Kerrigan, Whitney Marcellus, Stephon Tuitt, Derek Wolf, and Jack Crawford. Not, as Not scaring line, that offensive line. Linebackers, Craig Robertson, K.J. Wright. Defensive KJ backs, Wright. Malcolm Jenkins, Eric Weddle, Ricardo Allen, Jason McCourty, Buster Screen. Decent D-backs. And you the offensive about, line, stunning. And at this point, you have to wonder about <clears throat> Joe Hayden, right? Yeah. Which is stunning to me that he is not on a an NFL team. Yeah, that is. That's uh, a heck of a group of people that have retired in the last eight months. Well, the Sanders thing, too, like we had, you'd heard word that he was just wasn't maybe interested in playing. playing right. And yeah. so that – that bat was backed up. If the preseason indication illegal contact penalties are going to go way up this year, NFL officials called 22 illegal contact penalties during the preseason up from seven. Usually they do this just then, to set a tone and then they chill out. Yes. This according to Mark Maskey of Washington Post. So yes. there you go on that. I um, expect that to be chilled out. And, and that's something that, yes, it is, it, a, it is a point of emphasis. Mm -hmm. But for the purposes of regular season games, they do not want the field littered with laundry and so mm -hmm. that is something that that i think will be on par with what it has been in the past and now the nfl will make a legal contact a point of emphasis for the officials during the offseason training the officials listen calling up in 15 illegal contact penalties during pre we see preseason week ones so that goes to your point the league officiating office may have to hold refs to tamp down the illegal contact calls after that it's calls declined in the second and third yes that's the way that that goes. I wanted to ask uh, go over one other thing with you. Did you see the plans on the, what the Bears are trying to do in Chicago? So doing a domed stadium. It's in Arlington Heights. Yep. It's about 40 minutes from downtown Chicago um, is, is where the location is. It's in the old Arlington uh, racetrack area is the land that was purchased. Um, they released the plans for it yesterday. It looked like an ice cube. I don't know that that stadium is what it's going to look like. It's going to be a dome stadium is what they're going to do. They could do it as soon as 2026. They could get out of Soldier Field as soon as 2026. Um, as well they should. Soldier Field was renovated in – It's terrible. 2000-ish. Remember the Bears played in Illinois I was, for a couple of I years? I was living in Illinois and covering the Bears in Champaign, 2001 and yeah. 2002. Yeah. And it just comes down to – it's very similar to the situation that Ohio State's in with the horseshoe. You know, it's an old building. And Soldier Field's a historical landmark, so you can't do anything to the structure – so they tried to land a spaceship in it, and it didn't take, and it's still an old structure underneath it. So there's not there, much you can do you, with there's it. There's no the bars or restaurants. Mm -hmm. Everything is a hike. Everything is a walk. Oh, Parking yeah. Parking is impossible. That building on the outside with the columns and all that is cool. Sure yep. is. And then you go inside, and you're like, what the hell happened? Yeah. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know. They what didn't the... need to do anything. You didn't need to put a half of a spaceship on it. Like, no, that outside is sweet. When you come up mm -hmm. to Soldier Field, it is sweet. Sure it is. And then inside, it's like, huh? And if I'm not mistaken, you, the radio booth is like. It's in the stands. In the corner. No, no, no. It, it's not in the corner, but it is literally in the lower bowl. There's a roof. You, If the ball is kicked too high, you can't, can't see, see it. Ball. it. Yeah. From a kick, a punt. <laughs> field goal whatever the case might be if i open the door i can buy a beer or a hot dog from a vendor literally walking right down the hallway to the stands yeah so I could buy it from the stands <laughs> if they pull this off deep might have tried <laughs> if they pull this off it will leave just in terms of northern cities 
that and I'm going to add this part of it northern cities with an ability to in the infrastructure to host events be pretty limited because Green Bay but the, the, you're not hosting final fours and super bowls and stuff like that in Green Bay same with Buffalo their new stadium is going to be open air so you'd have the two in Pennsylvania the Jersey Stadium Foxborough us that's it up here well the domes make a lot of sense they sure do they make a lot of sense it turns out yeah and they make a lot of sense Mm -hmm. as well i see where you go in there if you have a private school if you have a city that has the ability and the infrastructure to host to host things other than nine football games then that's what you do that's what you do right and the bears are going to do it and chicago hasn't been a player ever for any of that stuff no think about it i don't even know is it still the third largest city in the country it has it was forever but i know houston was gaining on it quickly um it feels like the population shift south is only continuing um my hunch is it's still the third largest because it had a large lead on houston last time i looked at these type of things it was always the number three market um but they haven't had super bowls final fours wrestlemania's that type of stuff in Chicago. Chicago still is number three. What's the margin on that? New York one eight point six, LA two four million, Chicago three two point six, Houston four two point four. So it's right there. Chicago's two point seven, two point seven, Houston two point four, Phoenix one point seven, Philly one point six, San Antonio seventh one point six, San Diego one point five, Dallas one point four, and then San Jose one million. Would not have had San Jose. Boomtown, though, right? So the one thing that's a little deceiving there is that's city proper, I think, metro areas. It's still third on that, too, and it's actually more sizable. But they have lost population. Um, They're at 9.6 on the metro. Dallas is fourth. Houston is fifth. Dallas, 7.6. New York, New Jersey is 20, and L.A. is 13. Yeah, yeah, that's on the metro. That's on the metro, which I think is the number that's the – one because it's it, city lines and city sure. proper is always it, different it was, but it's a game changer for chicago yeah, if they it, get it. it was interesting though they kept saying throughout their announcement this by no means says that we're doing this yet like they're basically putting the onus on the that that property and, and the people that are maintaining they're it that, putting it on the people in arlington heights yeah, to pay for all this, the infrastructure we want to do it yeah. but we'll build the stadium but you're going to you're going to build the infrastructure with your tax dollars. We're going to pay. So the way that they're doing it is because everybody hates the optics of wealthy owners asking for tax money to build stadiums. So what they're saying is, fine, we'll take care of the building. You build the rest of it. That's the sales pitch. The problem is, is it's probably untenable for them to stay in downtown either way. I saw the mayor of Chicago uh, last week said, well, what if we put a dome on Soldier Field? That's not solving it, man. No. <laughs> it's getting worse. Not happening. It's still, That's what not what would that stadium look like if they put a dome on top of all that? Yeah, and it's still an old building. You know, the guts of it are an old, old building. So, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was fascinating in, in terms of where that could well, all go. W- when they were in town, like Jeff Joniak stopped by the booth, the play-by-play voice yeah. of the Bears who grew up here, uh, a couple other people from their radio team and whatnot, and every single person's like, yes, please move. Like, oh, yeah. move us to the suburbs. Like, let's get out of downtown Chicago. I think this it's is one ridiculous. of those things where if you're not from there or you don't have a, any vested in it, you're like, oh, the monsters of the Midway. They got to play sure, on Michigan sure. Avenue. They got to play downtown on the lake. But if you're someone who has to go to those games, you're saying, why? Why yeah, am I trekking why would into I do downtown that? to do yes. all of that? It's, it was no always good. a pain. Yeah. Like, the train, like, you still had to walk you half to walk a mile forever. to a mile, it yeah. felt like. I haven't been to a game there in 20 years, but the last time I was, it was the old Soldier Field without the spaceship, and it was cool, but it was still brutal, like getting in there, the walk, all of it. No good. Uh, Don't miss the Browns preview show tonight at 7 University Hospitals, Cleveland Browns Radio Network. Joel Batonio joins Ken and Gerard as guys preview Sunday's game with the Panthers. One of our newly named captains will join the program. Coming up next, Charlie Hewitt, one-on-one with Z. You're listening to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
Well, there's a new way to cheer on your Cleveland Browns with the help of your favorite four-legged companion, Barking Backers, presented by Milk Bone, is the Browns' newest club for pet parents worldwide. Sign up today at BarkingBackers.com. Barking Backers, the fan club for dogs. And we've got some pups in the studio here, all over around here. There's several of them. Dogs are everywhere. Dogs are everywhere. Uh, speaking of Z, you're going to hear from him right now. He's one-on-one with newly named Captain Charlie Hewitt. So in an organization. Guys are down. Ten minutes here. And Charlie Hewlett, my guest right now, our long snapper, eight straight seasons here with the Browns. Has it gone by in a blink? Like, is it crazy to hear that out loud? Uh, 100%. Um, I'd say it's, it's, when you look back on it, it seems like just yesterday I just got here, but uh, then you wouldn't really think through it. I mean, the, the time's definitely gone by, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's gone by in some sense for sure. When did you know that you had a gift for throwing a ball through your legs while bent over with your head on the ground? <laughs> I wouldn't say I ever knew I had a gift at it. Um, it's just something that kind of gradually I got better at. Uh, I got thrown in it in uh, college. I came to college as a tight end. Our long snapper quit. I'd done it in high school, so kind of got thrown into that competition real quick. And uh, ended up getting the job. Um, wasn't very good, but like I said, slowly kind of got better at it. And, uh, yeah, here we are. Definitely uh, was a blessing in disguise for sure. Have you ever talked to that guy that quit and said, you know what, if you hadn't done that, like maybe who knows w- where my life is right now? I, I haven't. I should look him up, though. I should yeah. definitely uh, get in touch with him. Yeah, send him, like, a Christmas gift once in a year, a nice little bottle of wine. Hey, thanks. You know, the thing's worked out pretty well for me. 100%. <laughs> so what is the art of long snapping in your mind? Um, Man, the art of long snapping. Um, It's an art. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. Uh, you know, it's – I would say the, the secret is, is just – you know, having good focus and, and really working at it a lot. I mean, it's it's a muscle memory thing, like a like a lot of uh, what football is. It's um, you know just getting a ton of reps, and, and like I say, gradually you'll just get more accurate. And, and over the years, uh, you know, who knows what could, what could happen with it. So just so people try to understand, like when let's go for a field goal, mm-hmm. okay? You've got a field goal kicker who likes the ball a certain way. The holder likes to receive it a certain way. You're not just trying to snap it to a spot. You're trying to snap it to a spot with the laces also in a particular spot when it, the ball arrives, right. which is crazy. Uh, well, it's, it's something that, again, you just do with a lot of reps, and you figure out what the rotation is on your ball, and you figure out the exact distance you need between you and the holder. So the holder's going to catch in the same spot. I know I've got to put my feet in a certain spot to be able to have the laces come out a certain way. Um, there's a few different ways you can do it. You can kind of rotate the ball in your hand before you snap it. Um, I like to change the distance just because we get you know, some rainy days here and stuff like that. I like to make sure my fingers are on the laces every time. So, um, But, yeah, that's just something that comes out with reps, and uh, especially every time you get a new holder or a new kicker or whatever, that can kind of change things up a little bit. But, uh, yeah, it's just repping it out, figuring it out. Do you know from the second that it leaves your fingers if it's perfect? 100%, yeah. Okay. And I tell the guys all the time, like, I, I know that one is right, but I don't know how far right it was. But if it's if it's right on the money, I, I kind of know as soon as it happens, yeah. When you are snapping, let's keep, say with field goals, we'll get to punts in a second. When you're snapping for a field goal, what are you? You snap it. You probably are hoping nobody, like, is throwing your head straight down into the ground or trying to jump over you, which, thankfully, the rules have told them to stop doing that and then what are you listening for um not, or is that what you're doing no no i mean it, it's it's not as much of a listening thing it's it's just uh it's more visual uh you can get kind of loud out there so we keep things visual and um no, i snap it and get up and block and uh like you said i know it is as soon as it leaves my hands if it's good or not so um if it's if it, some feels off i can tell you right now my, my heart sinks immediately and as soon as i see the ball go through the uprights i feel a lot better so <laughs> Is Cade unlike anybody that you've been around? 100%. Um, he has definitely got an incredible amount of talent. Um, and the best part about it is I think his, uh, his mindset's even better. Um, you know, he seems to be a very confident guy. Obviously, you know, we've, we've got to get, you know, through the, the test of, of first energy in December and stuff like that. But um, he seems to really have it all together. So I, I'm really excited to watch him this season. All right, let's go back to the last preseason game. Mm-hmm. Whose idea was it? Hey, let's try a 70 yarder. You know, we were just warming up and we just kind of kept backing it up and backing it up. And all of a sudden he was like, yeah, let's, uh, let's just go for a 70. And after, after we made it, I, I walk over to Preef. I was like, Preef, I don't think I've ever even snapped a ball on the other side of the 50 for a field goal before, much less made it. I was like, that was incredible. And he was like, yeah, that was, that was impressive. You know, Preef was just kind of like, yeah, it was, it was whatever. I was like, no, that was, that was pretty cool. But, um, a ton of talent there, for sure. So I was watching that from the booth, and I was like, it didn't even look hard, which was, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And then their kicker tried from 56 and hit the crossbar, and I was like, 
Sorry about that, brother. Sorry about that. Sorry you had to see that. I mean, if you look at a lot of his kicks that he's made from, you know, 55 to 58 or whatever it is, I mean, there's still a lot of room left on the end of that ball. So, I mean, it, it didn't surprise me that he could do it, but it was still pretty cool to watch. I mean, I thought he made that 47-yarder that he hit, which was his second make in that game after making from 57. I thought he made that 47-yarder look like an old extra point. I mean, it was just like a rocket. Yeah, he's got a ton of power. He's got a ton of power for sure. Um I don't know that I've seen anything like it, for sure. All right, let's talk about your relationship, because you guys are so tight. Mm -hmm. The three of you are spending so much time together. It was four while Joe was here. It was a good dude as well. You know, what's that relationship like with you and Cade and Corey? Because they're both new. You're the constant. You represented the team as the captain in those preseason games, and, and I don't know if, if that's going to continue. I'd like to see it. I thought you were great out there at the captaincy. Um, but what's that relationship like for the three of you guys? Um, well, it's something that just grows over time, and we're still growing it, but I'd say, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot closer through OTAs and training camp and stuff like that, but, uh, you know, it's good. I mean, they're great guys. We really get along. We've done some barbecues, gone out to dinner a couple of times, and um, I would say they, they definitely see, seem like a mature group, um, you know, to me, feeling like the freaking grandfather sometimes. Um, you know, maturity doesn't always quite match up with your, with your specialists, but this group is very mature, very humble, uh, just a, a great group of guys to, to be around. Like you think about kind of the variety, right? You're an established guy. You got kids. Your kids come running out here at training camp. You know, Cade's a very, very young guy. You know, a couple of years ago, you had the Hammer, who was a young guy. Then you had our great friend, of course, Cole. Mm -hmm. Do you still stay in touch with Cole? Oh yeah, I text him every once in a while. Um, talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he seems to be doing good, enjoying the the beach life down in Florida. He's having a great time. Did you notice that he got photographed as one of like the hot dad bods of Florida? Did you see that? My wife follows his wife, and yeah. somehow my wife pointed that out, and I was like. <sighs> I mean, can't even hate on him for it, you know? <laughs> it's so cool. It's perfect. I actually texted him this morning. I was joking with him about that again because every time I text him, I joke with him about that because I guess he doesn't like – he thought it wasn't a good flattering enough picture, which I think is classic Cole. A hundred percent. The guy's in great shape. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, he's, he's going to be getting some attention, you know? No, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> no doubt about that. All right, for you – Going into this season, you know, and we've had the highs of 2020. We've had some lows, obviously, that you've been a part of as well. What's kind of your mindset for being around this team? Because you get to observe this team as much as probably anybody, and you've seen it all, a lot of it. What's kind of your, your thoughts on this team and, and what can be accomplished this year? Uh, I think the sky's the limit. I mean, you know, every year, you know, you kind of have that mindset that we're going to accomplish great things. But, but truly, this, I think this is the most complete, talented team I've been around since I've been here. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what we can do. It's all about, you know, putting it together on the field. Um, but, you know, that's, like I said, that's the mindset every year. But this year, something definitely feels different in that locker room. We feel closer. The, the chemistry feels really good. And, and I'm excited about it. How excited do you actually play a game? I feel like this has been a long off season. I'm sure you felt that as well. But how exciting is it? Okay, now we get to play. Opening day is, is always my favorite. Um, the energy in the stadium is, is always amazing, whether home or away, especially home, obviously. But um, it, there's really no feeling like opening day, and um, I'm, I'm really excited about it, yeah. How do you feel that as a specialist, you know, in the preseason starters, oh, we get to do this, whatever, we get to sit around and wear jerseys. Not you, and yet you're the guy. Have you ever thought about that? Is that ever, or do you like it? You're like, I just, this is what I do. I'd, I'd rather be out there snapping and hitting some dudes and running down on punts. Um, you know, I, I've kind of owned my role a little bit. Um, like I said, when I, when I first went to college, I was a tight end and, and I was a little disappointed to be, you know, snapping, especially like as I went in, you know, yeah. through college, like junior, senior year, uh, I definitely miss playing tight end, but at this point, man, this is my role. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be here as a tight end. So, um, I'm happy to be a part of this team. I'm happy and excited about my role. And really all I'm focused on is, is doing my job as good as possible. Yeah. By the way, it's a nice compliment. There isn't another long snapper here. So you're like, sure. I'll take all the reps because then it's my gig. A hundred percent. I do not mind taking all the reps. Um, honestly, it helps me getting as many reps as possible. Um, you know, there's not, you, you know, I don't get to get 60 plays or whatever in practice. It's usually 10. Um, so, I would, I'd love to take all the reps, to be honest with you. Um, it just gets me more prepared. Do you think you have mastered sitting on a medicine ball and feeding that machine now? Because I thought your form this year was really, it was at a new level. It was elite. Watching it, I was like, that looks like fun and it looks like you're having a great time. 
you know, there's a science to it. Um, there's a lot of physics involved. You really got to make sure you've you've got the trajectory of the ball coming out of the jugs yeah. machine perfect. Um, the medicine ball is more, you know, ergonomic, so I, you know, I don't have any Good bad posture. posture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's really a lot of thought that, that goes into that. Um, obviously, you get a ton of reps doing that, and uh, it's really something that's evolved over time. Well, I've noticed you're because, you know, I could see you in the gym when we were sharing a gym for a while there. Your core strength was on point, and I think that just speaks to your ability to, to master the medicine ball like that. Well, that's that's 30 seconds. Um, it's it's more for the the jugs machine, 100. percent We got to get it, make sure our punter and, and holder is is uh, he gets as many good reps as possible from that jugs. Is there anything different about snapping to a left-footed punter? They tend to want the ball more on their left side. Um, so you know, I had Jamie last year, and then and then Dustin Colquitt as well. They were all left-footed. Oh, yeah, so sure. I've I've been used to it. Cole was the outlier, the original Cole. Yes, yes, he was the last time I had a, a right a right-footed punter. So yeah, they tend to want the ball more on their left side. Um, it's not a huge adjustment. Yeah. You know my my target point, I guess. All right, do you, are you going out there for the coin toss, or is it secret? I don't think. It... Last one here. Uh, yeah. Let's go. All right, what's your go-to? Um, I always go tails. Never fails, Charlie. This has been a great pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks. You're up. <laughs> if you're just new to this show, in the last sorry, no kidding, but in the last three years, because he's just Cole. There's no other point. His hand wax, His hand wax is, is still is, here to is this here day. To this day, that's right. He walked in here with wax on his hands and kombucha. Love the kombucha. He handed us a taste. It was delicious. I, I it was a delight. I don't know that I found another kombucha I've liked as much as the one that Cole offered, and I don't know where he got it. It's got to be a player kombucha that's yeah. downstairs. It must be a real delight. It is a delight. Um, and then you know he he made this gorgeous wax molding. Um, and then we were conversing with him this morning. He finally got back to us. He was on yeah. a trip, and of course, we're referring to Britton Colquitt, uh, the first Cole to punt. I don't us. know if they didn't know who Cole was if they get to know that, but it was nice. That's of true. You. That's not you might. I could have overstepped. I'm fine with that. That's okay. Yeah, but he went on a he went on a RV trip with his family. And it's a it's a brood. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And they went around, and it went. He said everything that could go wrong did, and I. I tweeted him back, sexy back, some of the effect of, well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It that's would. RV trip. That's, that, that's what it is. That's, of course it's going to go poorly. You don't win. You don't win doing that. No. Funny. I like Charlie. I liked it. Yeah. I love Hewlett's great. I mean, he's eight year, eighth year is a long snapper. Mm -hmm. He's not a long snapper. If the long snapper at his college team doesn't just qu up and quit. And he gets a chance to do it and ends up winning it. And now he's in the NFL, has a great job, making great money, and long snapping like a champion. I mean, it's awesome. What a story. I well, think it's a great story. I think it is, too. And I, I think the other thing that's interesting about it is, is you say to yourself, it's such a specific skill set that once you find somebody who does it well, you can kind of have it forever. You know? Yeah. Like you, just... Dude, you can be there forever. No doubt. Yep. Agreed. What's the um, – let me see this. No, Boy, there's a lot of Charlie Hewlett's. I was just trying to see, like, the, the uh, career achievement situation for Charlie in terms of college and everything else. He's a man of great consequence and, sure, and achievement. Know. For sure. But I guess what I was going for was if that doesn't happen, very likely not here. No, and not definitely anywhere not anywhere at this point, not in the league. So he's a UCF guy. Yeah, to be a tight end. 6'4", 248, yeah. played at UCF, was undrafted, and found his way. Yeah. And then away you go. And has been in the league, my gosh, since 2012. He was an undrafted free agent. He's been in the league. And so, yeah, it's it's really an awesome story. And you think about it coming full circle and, and now for the second time being named a captain. Of the Cleveland Browns, 2019 too, and now in 2022, that special teams group could be special. I, I, I agree. I drafted York in the uh, in a fantasy. I did too, and one last night uh, yeah. with S. I was drafted with S, and he's like, "We got to get Cade York," so we took him early. And somebody's like, "Cade York," I'm like, dude, booms it. Trust me, boom. Plus, it. we could play for field goals, maybe. Who knows? Who knows? But I mean, I think he's a stud. Hit some bombs, yeah, and away you go. Away you go. All right, uh, there really is so much more to come. You listen to Cleveland Browns Daily on 850 ESPN Cleveland.
And the Land on Demand is remodeled by the Bath Authority, and it's been free for the entire month of August. And if you like what you saw, read and heard, it's time to subscribe for the Brown season at LandOnDemand.com. Watch your favorite shows, a new HD quality video. Follow the season with Tony Grossi's columns, the Daily Grossi podcast, and the 100 Years Pod. Hear your favorite shows on demand without commercial interruptions. Go to LandOnDemand.com to subscribe today. And we have some television news. Larry Fitzgerald headed to Monday Night Countdown, officially retired, I would say, at that point. I think he's going to be great, too. I think he's going to be fantastic at it. So, Field Yates, in response to Adam Schefter's tweet about that he would be a part of ESPN's Monday Night Countdown and welcoming him to the team, Mm -hmm. Field Yates tweeted tweeted out what I think is maybe the most incredible statistic I can even fathom for a wide receiver. Okay. Larry Fitzgerald finished his 17-year career with more tackles, 41, then dropped passes, 29. <laughs> so 41 times a ball was intended to him and or was for somebody Or somebody. Yeah, and he made the tackle. Like the Super Bowl when he chased down yeah. uh, James Harrison. Wow. That is staggering. 41 tackles, 29 drops. He averaged just – he didn't even average two drops a year, and he was heavily targeted. Yes, he was. Yeah. Larry Fitzgerald. Yep. What a career. I'm glad that he got to – you know, it's funny. He got to play – ended up having – it was a tough franchise when he got there, but he got to play with Warner and Palmer and have some statistical achievement and get all the way to his Super Bowl, and then even Kyler at the end. So he He's really a first did. ballot, yeah. For sure. Yeah, he's got to be. Right, so let's look at the resume Feels like it to quickly. me. I mean, how many first-team All-Pros are we talking about? It's tough. One. It's a crowded category. One first team all pro, eleven time Pro Bowler, was the yeah. Walter Payton Man of the Year. Eleven time Pro Bowler. Eleven time Pro Bowler. That's enough. Led the league in receptions twice, led the league in receiving touchdowns twice. He had I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand yard seasons, four over fourteen hundred yards. A buddy of mine who I went to college with lives in Mesa and uh, his neighbors with uh Larry Fitzgerald belong to the same golf course. Nicest nicest guy ever. From the year nicest t- guy ever, according to him. From the year 2005 until 2017, he was only not a pro bowler twice. Yeah. That's first ballot gold jacket. Yeah, that feels like it. Start getting that sized up. Big TV media day today with that happening with Monday Night Countdown, and then McAfee is going to be full-time on college game day. Yeah. That became official as well. And my hunch is that he will replace Lee Corso on that at some point. I mean, he's on right now. He's starting this week. The deal got done, which is odd that they let week one of the season go before getting him on, but he'll start this week on college game day. And my hunch, and I think he could do it authentically without it feeling contrived. He could do the helmet gear or the mascot, whatever way of picking games, which is such a, such a key to their whole operation. And of course it was 89. Like it's, it's tough. Sad. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that makes a lot of sense for Pat to do that. So one big, minute. big moving and shaking there kids. All right. Next level is coming up next. We are back tomorrow on a thursday edition and we've got nfl games how about that away we go let's go you're listening to the browns daily on 850 espn cleveland